this is Annie Grace and welcome to this Naked Mind podcast. So I'm super excited because I recently made a new friend and this is Janie Lee Grace and I'm going to let her tell you her story, but welcome Janie. It's so nice to have you here. Oh, it's fantastic to be able to speak with you, Annie. I'm such a fan. And um, where do I start with my story? Well, um, I wear a lot of hats. I'm a presenter and an author and uh, an, an interestingly a well-being kind of expert in inverted commas. I've been running a, a website on holistic living for years and I've written best-selling books and I'm telling you this because I've, I'm kind of a little bit known in the whole holistic health world if you like and that's why it's so bizarre to me when I look back now to think that through all of that discussion and all of the stuff I was doing about living well and eating well and good nutrition and your mindset and all of this stuff that I've been talking about for years and years and years and years, still I was drinking way too much. And, you know, looking back, it's, it's incredible to me, but I finally was able to stop. And, and that for me was the, the missing piece of the, of the jigsaw, if you like. And it's all of a sudden, oh, wow, now I get it. Now, now I start, can start to understand what actually proper holistic living means because before there was always there was always a gap there was always something and it was absolutely the booze no that's amazing so why don't you walk us all the way back to even you know early days teenager childhood like when was when was your first drink when you were, were you introduced to alcohol uh, okay, I, 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 I started fairly late, I think. So probably not till I was at uh, university and um, kind of, yeah, late, late teens, early 20s. Um, and in the early days, I suppose I, uh, I'm grateful now to think that I, I couldn't, I was one of those people that couldn't hold my beer, as we say in the UK. So I didn't actually drink very much, which was probably a good idea, you know, one glass and, and I was done. But um, then I think it really kind of ramped up uh, when I had my kids and I had my kids quite late um, and we had uh, two young children um, quite close in age uh, and then I had another two so I got four all together but when the first two were very young I remember feeling as any new mum feels just absolutely frazzled I was working I was you know massively massively busy I remember at one point I was doing a, a tv show and, and a radio show and I was, it was six days a week and the kids and it's oh you know there was like so much going on and and the, the, the booze was my reward yeah what did you go to university for uh, performance arts. Okay. So, and then... so, so, so unlike you, I'm not a scientist. <laughs> I may have a degree, but it's in showing off. <laughs> well, that's brilliant. I love it. Um, and then, so you went to university and didn't drink a lot and then mm. got married? Uh, and... No, uh, there was a lot of years where I didn't get married. <laughs> a lot okay. of years where I, was, where I was with the wrong guy and I was touring the world as a singer. Um, and again, um, I'm quite grateful because through all those kind of rock and roll years when I was working as a singer, actually, I didn't drink that much. I had the occasional uh, time when I would, would drink a bit too much and that would kind of scare me a bit. And I think, oh, my goodness, uh, th this, that doesn't feel great. Um, so I'd managed to kind of rein it in. I mean, looking back, I suppose back then I had an off switch. You know, one of the things I always say now is I don't. But back then I kind of did. I was able to control in inverted commas and and I uh, could absolutely see because I was in the music industry I could see what what you know drugs and alcohol did I could see it all the time and I, I always knew I, I didn't want to go there um, so I suppose I was able to for it not to be on my mind all the time for me to drink occasionally so there were a good number of years when um, I, when I didn't I didn't overdo it so it really was when I had my kids which was you know for me late I was already into my 30s when I had my kids and and that's really when it it, it became every day you know we had enough money we had a, a home we had you know young kids we had people coming round. you know it's kind of you open a bottle of wine and I got into that kind of um, habit really yeah, that was, that's so similar to me. I mean, I didn't have my um, youngest till I was 30. I mean, sorry, my oldest till I yeah, was 30. Yeah, exactly, yeah. The youngest I had at 39. So, um, yeah, I was going to ask if, if sort of your rock and roll lifestyle for a while was more of a cautionary tale or if that's where it all had started. That was one of the things I was quite keen to know yeah. about your, yeah. your journey. 
Yeah, no, I mean, I think I think I was quite lucky in that respect. There was always booze available. I mean, as you can imagine, every you know every gig there was there was um, lots of booze in the dressing rooms, and 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 then after show parties, and and you know it was a very sort of it was quite a rock and roll lifestyle. So it it really was only that I. Uh, fortunately it didn't didn't have the same desire that that crept in later um i mean thank thank god because i hate to think what would have happened and 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 i never ever tried drugs i'm very grateful about for, for that actually um that i didn't go down that slippery slope i was fearful i was always fearful lots of people around me were trying all kinds of stuff and and i was um really afraid of being out of control actually so um so fortunately i didn't ever do that that's so interesting. It's, it's again, mirrors in a way, my kind of corporate journey. I, I feel yeah. like when things started to get out of control is when I really got serious about stopping. Cause I was so afraid of being the person, yeah. you know, at the Christmas party falling over or stumbling or, you know, there was a lot of that. And I, I did, I did try pretty much once or twice, most things except marijuana. I smoked for um, three years, four years, maybe. Right. But other than that, yeah, it was, and that was kind of like this, I don't know, I caught, it was like a marshmallow addiction is what I felt like it was just so harmless compared to the other stuff I was doing. Not to say that it didn't still, still get the best of me, but yeah, um, yeah. anyway, so that's so fascinating. Yeah. I think we have a lot of similarities there. Yeah, okay. Yeah, right. Yeah. So you've, you've married, you've, you've had your children and, um, and you're, you know, having bottles of wine here and there. And are there any specific times or, or memories that you had where you're like, huh, I don't know about this. Or, or was it all just kind mm. of like, yeah, no, this is good. Uh, I, I remember that when the kids were young and I was uh, working at a radio station, um, I was doing overnight shows, uh, or, um, uh, sorry, late, late night shows. So I would start at like 10 PM for a while. Um, and, uh, yeah. It was very it was quite 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 tough because I had you know young young kids and um, so it was quite tough but the way I kind of made it work was that I would sort of meet friends for dinner um, you know in London and then go straight to the radio station and I and I do remember back one occasion when I actually went on air drunk I mean I'm so ashamed when I think about it now my god I mean of course I got through it nobody would have known but I knew I knew and that that you know that really kind of crossed a boundary for me um the one thing that doing a degree in performance arts taught me was to be professional at all times and I was like what the hell am I doing um so I remember that it was a long time ago but I really remember it and then after that there were a few occasions where I you know we had the odd party and I and I felt terrible the next day um but for a lot of years it just rolled on because it was just what absolutely everybody did so I don't think it ever crossed my mind that I wouldn't do it because everyone did it. You know, I've heard you say, you know, that your boss, well, you said on my, on my podcast, you know, your boss kind of expected you to do it. And, and I think it was, it was similar. Um, I'm sure there must have been a few people in the radio station that didn't drink, but I don't remember who. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't. I honestly, I don't remember anybody in our corporate yeah. world who didn't drink. Yeah. And yeah. maybe I just didn't make them my people or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's so interesting. Have you have you read Dan Harris, Ten Percent Happier? He's a new. No, author. I haven't. Oh, that sounds like the sort of thing I'd love. But no, I haven't read oh, that. Oh, you would love it. It's okay. it's about mindfulness. It's about kind of a a layman's introduction to mindfulness. I okay, think. And he cool. writes. He's just hilarious. And um, anyway, he's a news anchor on you know our largest uh, news shows over here. And so he he actually writes about it was it was cocaine, not alcohol, but it was a time where he was on air and right. had oh, a God. major panic attack. And oh. like, it's still one of those things where it was just so intense. Awful. And anyway, it just yeah. popped into my mind that you might enjoy that book. Yeah, definitely. I mean, what, I mean, what's quite interesting is now, and I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this, but now I look back, I, it's only now that I'm no longer feel that way that I look back and realize just how unbelievably anxious I was all of the time, all of the time, actually. I didn't even know I was an anxious person. Yeah, that's crazy. I know, right? It's amazing to me how just 
calm I am. And, and don't get me wrong. I still have my anxiety. I still have my bouts of yeah. it, but yeah. compared, I don't, compared. I don't have to medicate for it anymore. It's exactly. just incredible. I know. I know. I love that. I love hearing stories of people who've come off antidepressants for God's sake. But as we've said before, you know, both of us, there isn't actually anything that ditching the booze doesn't make better. Yes, is there? So there isn't true. anything that it doesn't. So that's true. a double negative sentence, but you know what I mean? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, okay. So then, You've had kind of those moments and, um, and then your kids are growing up and, mm. and what, what's going on? Well, I've got, I've got four children. So the, the younger two, I think what happened was, I think where it really ramped up, because you usually can remember a time when it really kind of hit. And that was when um, the, the young, we moved, we moved house so that we could be nearer to a school. We were home edding for years and then we decided that we've got four kids enough already they need to go to school. So we moved house so that they could go to school. And um, that was, I suppose, about nine years ago, something like that, uh, nine, possibly 10. Um, and, and that was when it really ramped up because I was living, I was massively busy, lots and lots of work and lots of stuff going on, four kids. Uh, the youngest was um, uh, probably about four, um, three or four. And, uh, and we, we moved to a, a, an area where there were shops and wine bars like right around the corner so uh all of a sudden i i i realized you know i i i've been working i'm so stressed i'm you know i need me time and 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 i connected the glass of wine as the as the reward and so if it was possible for me to have any childcare, if there was anyone who could look after the kids i'd take off with my husband and if he couldn't come i'd go on my own and i'd take a book and i saw this as me time i really actually did yeah. I really did. I look back now and I think, what the hell? But that was my reward. That was me being grown up, you know. Um, and of course, it started off as one glass. I'd have one glass, you know. And then, of course, I'd have, uh, it ended up, ended up with me. I mean, how the wine bar is still in existence without me, I don't know. Because it kind of ended <laughs> up with me, me having about three glasses there. I mean, they would just kind of keep pouring it, you know, and I'd keep drinking it. They'd, I'd have about three glasses there and then I'd come home and have more with dinner. So, you know, it, it, that's when it really ramped up. Yeah. Yeah. And so when did you start to think like, hmm, I mean, did, when did you get really into, so you made a career. It, it feels like you've had lots of different lives within your life. Yeah, quite, I do. I do. I, I do wear a lot of hats. <laughs> yeah. But, but throughout it all, I mean, since, um, I mean, certainly for the last 15 years, I've been doing the health and well-being stuff. My, my website is called Imperfectly Natural. I'm glad I called it that so that I didn't have to get everything right. But then I took it slightly too far. <laughs> um, I love that. But yeah, so, um, so, uh, so yes, I was always doing the well-being stuff. It never occurred to me that, um, that drinking didn't fit that because that was my imperfectly natural, guilty little secret kind of thing. But I, I thought it was fun. You know, I, I just thought it was fun. Um, and I, but, but I definitely did have times when I, I knew something had to change. And there were quite a few of them. Um, one was uh, probably about six or seven years ago when I went on a retreat. I went on Jason Vale's retreat, actually. He's a good friend of mine. And I went on Jason's retreat. And um, during that time, obviously, I didn't drink. And I realized I felt so much better. Mm -hmm. So I, I ditched the booze for um, a good probably six months, something like that. Uh, I lost a little bit of weight. I felt better. Um, but it was always in my mind, oh, I'm doing this so that I can lose a bit of weight and, you know, look okay for something I had coming up or whatever. And then, of course, as soon as a, that period of time had kind of come to an end, it was, oh, right, I've got this now. I can have one. It was that classic thing. And of course I couldn't, you know, so I had, I had lots of those, lots of those, Oh, I'll give up for a bit. And I could always give up for a bit. Um, and it was always, it always felt beneficial. So it did up. feel beneficial. Because Jason Vale, he does, um, it was mainly juicing and I know he That's does, right. he's written a brilliant book on alcohol. That's but right. Yeah. He really had it. He's very into 
sort of yeah, holistic exactly, yeah. detox and juicing. Yep, and exactly. So, so it was absolutely the, 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 the detox. So I'd go and do Jason's retreats. I'd go and do seven days on juice and smoothies. And I'd come back. And even to me, it felt bizarre to put alcohol in my body. Right. Um, you know, so I'd always have a little bit of time where, it, you know, I kind of hung on to it. But then the, the second I went to a party or got invited out, I'd be back. I'd be straight back onto it, you know, because... Yeah. But, you know, then nothing had clicked in my brain that this was not a good idea. It seemed like a good idea at the time until I started to get the waking up at 3 a.m. thing. Yes, yes. <laughs> so yeah. not fun. And it's funny, too, how even that waking up at 3 a.m., I feel like that had to go on for a long time for me to even oh, be conscious time. of a it during the day. Time. Right. Absolutely. How weird is that? I know. Absolutely. I, I had so many of those, so many of those kind of, you know, those, those making a deal with God things, as I call it, you know, the, the kind of waking up, okay, God, you know, look, if, if, if you just let me feel okay, but really busy day tomorrow, please just let me be okay. Let me, let me not have a hangover. Let me be perfectly fine. Let me have loads of energy and I'll never drink again, you know? And, and, and interestingly enough, you know, God kept his side of the bargain on account of, I usually didn't have a hangover because my tolerance was so great, but, Obviously, I, you know, drank as soon as it got to 6 p.m. the following night. It all uh, caution had gone to the wind. It's so funny how we yeah. just do that. It's almost like we compartmentalize. It's, it's very bizarre. I mean, I'd sometimes sit, look back now and I just think how weird, you know, if, if that were food, if that was some kind of allergy you had, you know, if you, if you, if you had something, if you had some kind of food and it made you ill, um, you'd never touch it again. You, you yeah. certainly wouldn't go, well, okay, I've had an unbelievably terrible day. You know, after that, I think I'll do it all over again in about 10 minutes. You know, it's just weird. So interesting. <laughs> so interesting. Um, all right. So then moving on, you kind of, when did you, you know, the 3 a.m. started to happen? They went on for a long time and, and then what? Yeah. So the, the, the 3 a.m. wake ups were, um, were, were pretty bad. And then over the um, last, I suppose, 18 months of my drinking career, um, it started to really, I started to think about it a lot. So I started to kind of reach out for help tentatively, very tentatively. I, um, I went to, in the course of my work, I, I often end up reviewing treatments and therapies and that kind of thing. You know, I'm, I'm really lucky. I get invited to, to try stuff. And so occasionally if I was feeling safe with the therapist or whatever I would kind of run it by them so you know I remember having a having a treatment um uh, a kind of a therapeutic um session I think it might have been NLP and various other things combined and she was a, an amazing therapist she was wonderful but um and I and I felt really comfortable with her and so towards the end of the, the you know sort of treatment I said listen the, you know there is something else can I I just want to say you know I'm kind of worried about my you know I'm worried I'm drinking too much I'm, it's almost like there's a voice in my head and and I so I shared this with her and you know bless her she said what pretty much everyone says well you know you look fine sounds normal yeah. to me yeah. you know yeah. and so I went away thinking oh thank god for that thank god right. for that I'm fine you know right. and then over the course of about 18 months that happened over and over I mean occasionally someone would say oh okay well um you know maybe you should try a few drink free days or um have a glass of water in between wow yeah okay I'll try that <laughs> not <laughs> what you, I mean just don't ever say have some drink free days to someone who's <laughs> someone who's telling you I need to give up um and and even the GP you know said the same thing oh well you how much are you drinking obviously you lie I mean everyone lies so I I, I lied and said well a couple of glasses of wine a night and I mean she probably knew I was lying so she could have easily doubled that herself you know known I was lying and then the answer was well you know, just have a, make sure you have plenty of water and try and have a day off. You know? Wow. Yeah, so, you know, the, the, I mean, this is, this is the thing that incenses me most now. I mean, I hope it's changing with all the awareness that, that people like you are bringing. I hope it's changing. But, but back then, and that was only three years ago, um, I, I must have asked, I mean, I don't know, there must have been at least 10, 10 to 15 occasions over the course of that period of time when I asked when I reached out that for me was huge a huge thing to have to do um but nobody got it so I, so I genuinely thought I was the only one genuinely I thought I was the only person who felt like that very lonely place to be yeah yeah 
And then what? What happened? And then, then and then I, um, I, uh, as part of my work at uh, the BBC, I work on a show where we interview um, celebs and guests and authors. And so we um, usually, when we get uh, an author coming in, we're given their book the night before if we're lucky, uh, or on the day. You know, it's just the way it works. But on this particular occasion, it was December 2017, and we were due to interview Claire Pooley, author of The Sober Diaries, in the following January. And so we had about two weeks off, off work, for, you know, which was unusual. So the producer actually handed me the book and said, oh, could you read this over the, over the break? Because we're going to be interviewing this author on the first week back. So I look at this book and think, wow. <laughs> there's a sign there's a sign okay and I've got plenty of time to read it um so I did and um it was it was like the light had gone on because um you know Claire's very relatable and she shared her own story she's a busy mom with just like me and saw the drink as the reward and all of the same stuff and uh, and yet she got through it she describes it was tough but she also got through it and she then she touches on this whole other world that I had never ever been aware of you know um and it was just uh it was bizarre actually so I I, I read the book I I finished the book on December the 30th and that was it never so drank again and it was interesting because of course I only decided I would stop for well, till Claire came in, <laughs> I thought I'll stop till she comes in and that'll be a really nice kind of experiment, you know, and I'll be able to tell her, you know, I've done that. Um, and then, so of course I, uh, she came in on the, I don't know, whatever, 5th of Jan and I, and I did tell her and she was so lovely and she said, oh, carry on, carry on. And here's my email address and I'll, I'll support you. Because of course I told nobody, not one soul um, that I was doing this apart from Claire. Um, oh, that's so cool. Yeah. So, um, so that was it. It was, it was, it was, I now know that the big, big difference was catching sight of a life beyond. And I'd mm -hmm. never seen that. That was the massive, massive difference. Because I've, even the times I'd given up before, I, I'd known in my heart that, you know, ditching the booze was going to be good for me and it was going to be a better thing to do. But I didn't have the motivation because I had nothing to aim for. I, I didn't know that there was a better world. I thought, thought it was just that I was just going to have to accept that I, I, life was going to be crap and miserable yeah <laughs> yeah it's so amazing to like have that that vision that, oh wait everything i believe about how you know what sobriety really is is not yeah. really true and now you've gone on to do a tedx talk which is is like yeah. i love the title of it it's is it sobriety, sobriety Rock? rocks who knew yeah, yeah. so perfect yeah. right Oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, because it, it, it was, I was so, I was just so blessed to get that opportunity because, um, uh, yeah, it was, a, it was amazing to be able to do that. And I wanted to choose a title like that because I, I, I you know, even though obviously everything's opened up and, it, and it's great and it's, things are different, even to how they were two years ago, I do still know that there are still people who are exactly how I was. They think they're the only ones <laughs> and they think that sobriety is, you know, as the word seems to suggest, sober and boring. And, you know, as I say in the TED talk, you know, it might, sober might be an anagram of bores, but it certainly is not boring. Um, so, yeah, it was great to be able to share that. Yeah. But, yeah. but it's interesting because, you know, I think I touched on already for the, at least the first three months, I didn't, I didn't tell anybody other than Claire. I, mean, I used to literally send Claire emails saying, oh God, I, I, there isn't anybody else I can share this with. I thought, crap, I'm so fed up. I've, I've, and she, she'd write back and say, you've hit the wall, sweetheart. <laughs> It'll get better. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, but what is that about? That, sh that kind of, um, you know, guilt and shame where we don't, don't tell anybody. I mean, I now know I did it completely wrong. I should have, should have got connected and got support. But it worked. So you did, yeah. you did what you yeah. did. I, and I do think, I mean, I think that what, what's happening in our culture right now is so cool because I, I think this needs to be a wellness conversation. This needs to be exactly. an imperfectly uh, natural conversation. Yeah, exactly. A health exactly. conversation, not an addiction yeah. conversation. Because the truth is that most of us drinking, um, it, I mean, to be fair, when you're GP or, you know, you, your therapist is therapist. saying, well, you look all right to me, they're exactly. comparing you to a clinical addiction. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And, so, and, and if, if they don't have experience of it, I mean, most of them obviously are drinking themselves. Right. Right. So, so clearly they don't have any experience of it or, or they kind of just joke about it. 
And that's, that's the thing that's so interesting to me is that we're, you know, if, if somebody came in and felt like they weren't quite comfortable in their own skin, because maybe they, they felt like they needed to, I don't know, lose 20 pounds and your GP says, no, no, you look great to me, Exactly. but they're not comfortable exactly. because they know that they used to weigh 20 pounds less. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, so their yeah. GP, they actually have more internal knowledge than anybody exactly. externally. And I think that would be really my challenge for anybody listening is like, don't, don't think of this as addiction. You don't have to be addicted. You don't have to be exactly. clinical. I mean, this, you know, totally. this is exactly what I say in the TED talk that we, it's almost like we've been brainwashed all of us into thinking there really are just these two types of drinkers. There's those at rock bottom, you know, who, who the GP would be able to help. Okay. I'll send yeah. you to alcohol services and rehab. Cool. And they'd yeah. see it. And they'd, they'd everybody, everybody else. Everybody else. would be telling, right? <laughs> it would be like, you're drinking yeah. first thing in the yeah. morning. You know, yeah, you're driving exactly. drunk. There's, yeah. there's harm happening. That's not yeah. most of yeah. us. Exactly. Exactly. And that's why, you know, I, I, I love um, Jolene Park's work. And I, I've, I've trained now as a, a, a coach with Jolene because the whole thing of being a gray area drinker, that is where most of us are. And we are on that spectrum. And, and, but I didn't know about that. You know, I didn't know. I really, really didn't know. I thought I was the only one feeling like this with a voice in my head. Um, and that voice is, is really strong. You know, if you're a bit of a, if you're quite a driven person, you're quite an all or nothing person, you know, when you've got a voice in your head telling you to do something, you, 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 you go, you go do it because you, you think you're being, um, kind of bullshit. You know, you th yeah. I, I used to think that was my one little act of rebellion, you know, against the world, you know, kind of, um, yeah, I'm just, I'm, I, I need, I'm going to look after myself. <laughs> I mean, the irony of it, yeah, <laughs> which I, I guess... see now. If, if you don't, if you're listening to this and you don't hear anything else, just hear that nothing actually has to be wrong for you yeah. to want to change this. Exactly. And just start to get a glimpse of what it could be like on the other side, you know, check out um, the TED talk because that's, that's a great place to start. You also have a podcast, right? Um, yeah. And you were one of my guests. I'm so yeah. thrilled to say people loved it. Yeah. The podcast, I started the podcast, um, last February uh, so um, when I'd been uh, sober for just over a year and again I, I really started the podcast because um, I, I because I wanted to interview people like you <laughs> and because I'd been listening to podcasts and they'd been so much part of my uh, journey you know and helped me so much and then I thought oh my goodness I'm, I'm finding out about all these people that I really want to interview so I better start one um, so again it was just it still is just a labor of love and you know I'm not I don't have a publisher or anything you know I just I just get on and do it but the success has been amazing because you know I've just I've had some brilliant brilliant guests and and I learn something every single time and I just absolutely love being able to share um, different people's stories and 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 expertise and and that's where I think everything's changing because um, yeah I mean there weren't enough of them when I first um, uh, ditched the booze um, but now of course there's lots and it is called alcohol free life brilliant yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So good. So good. Yeah. Um, and so what is life, what is life like now for you these days? And, and what are, I guess, before we get into that, why don't, why don't I start with this question? What, what were some of the difficulties? I know you said you didn't tell a lot of people really up front. Mm. Yeah. But you did start sort of coming out, so to speak. You know, how did, how yeah. did that go? Um, well, um, you know, the truth of it is, uh, I, I, the difficulties for me, I, I did keep everything to myself. I, I wish I had got a bit more support. Um, but, you know, I, I, I got through it. Um, but I did feel, I remember feeling very chaotic, chaotic and raw and all over the shop, an emotional roller coaster, absolutely, in, you know, up one minute, down the next, grumpy, um, quite miserable. And I was one of these people that I'd, I'd fully expected to feel incredible within two weeks. I thought I would have lost a couple of stone and weight and, you know, I'd be sleeping well and I'd be all sort of shiny eyed. <laughs> Of course, the reality was way different to that. I don't, you know, it was hideous. I had all kinds of digestive problems and all, and everything kind of went. I had, I remember getting leg cramps in the night. So what the hell? You know, I mean, all kinds of weird stuff went on. Um, but I was doing a lot of research. I mean, that, that's the thing. I was, I was absorbing. Um, I, was, I was really literally inhaling 
information and, and inspiration. So although I wasn't sharing my own story, I was hearing so much about other people's that I, I, I had enough to keep me, keep me motivated. You see, I now know as well, um, having, having worked with Jolene Park, I now know that back then my brain chemistry was all over the shop. No wonder I felt terrible because everything was trying to recalibrate and I wasn't doing anything to help it, nothing. You know, so I, I'm guessing my serotonin was really low and my you know, dopamine and all that was probably just shot to pieces. Um, so I didn't make it easy for myself. And, and I think I probably could have made it a little easier if I'd known what I know now. Um, but, but anyway, I, I did get through it and eventually start to feel better. Um, in terms of what, when I came out, as it were, um, I have to say, um, there wasn't really any flack. Amazingly, I, I, it, quite, quite surprisingly. I think this is one of the things that people stress about massively and they think that they're going to lose all their friends and, and, and their colleagues. And actually, I didn't make a really very big deal of it and neither did they. Um, mostly, I, 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 I took your advice. I heard you say once on a podcast, you know, when rather than making a big deal of it, if somebody says, you know, do you want a drink? You go, I love a drink. Thank you very much. I'll have a sparkling water, you know, rather than, well, actually I'm not drinking because, you know, just, and, and I don't, most people don't, didn't, didn't know unless they were close to me. And I mean, I, I you know, some of, some of it was a little bit difficult. I, I, because I think, I think one of the most difficult things was having to kind of, um, live with myself actually. Mm -hmm. And I get that even now, sometimes I, um, I kind of look back and I think, oh my God, those years that I wasn't as you know present for my kids as I could have been um and I, I don't I'm not quite sure what you do with that that's um those regrets and that guilt and you know I mean the 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 hey house author in me would say of course you know you you, you write that experience a love letter you know and you embrace it um but it's tough those bits are tough but actually when it comes came to kind of dealing with other people it was fine yeah, yeah, for sure. So a few things that you said that I want to just quickly touch on. So if um, Jolene Park is brilliant for really balancing the brain chemistry. Yeah, and if you're exactly. listening to this podcast, I have interviewed Jolene um, and we talk, we go into that. So very specific yeah. stuff. There's also another podcast on this Naked Mind podcast with my naturopath, um, Dr. Terry Trinka. And okay. he goes in very specifically to like things. So if, if people want more, because I think yeah, that's great. such a good point. It's like you you take this one thing out and, exactly. and then you like add other stuff in that are good. Yeah. Enough. So important to do the adding in because, yeah. you know, while you're going through that thing of, I can't have that, you know, the, the little toddler in you is going, but I want it. <laughs> you yes. So you need to be adding some good nutrients in to help balance that. And then, of course, the sugar monster comes in for yes. many of us. I think I've, didn't I hear you say that you mainlined Haribo's or something? Yes, <laughs> Jelly yes, babies gummy or bears something. My, yeah, 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 gummy bears. bears. So, yeah, you know, a lot of us get that, don't we? You know, we get the sugar monster. And there are things you can do just to help that a little bit. So, yeah, I really recommend that. Even yeah, help it. it. And then, um, you know, one of my favorite pieces of advice about the sugar is, I mean, it's just your brain doing what it should do, right? It's been overstimulating your dopamine. Uh, response with alcohol and so yeah. you take alcohol away and your brain is like where's the dopamine oh my gosh yeah. and, and yeah. sugar is right there and it does the same thing right but you're not going to go crash your car eating gummy bears so sometimes I say exactly be be a bit gentle with yourself it passes yeah. it really exactly. does your brain balances I do I no longer I don't even know the last time I ate a gummy bear <laughs> so, <laughs> it really does pass um, naturally. Your your body naturally really does heal itself. And it's brilliant because you actually become so much healthier than you expected that your body becomes much less tolerant to things. So if you, you do have a bit of Halloween candy or something like that, you're like, oh, that doesn't feel good. And exactly. It's, it's interesting how your body really, once you become, once you stop numbing the natural yeah. sensations, you become so much more in tune with uh, everything that is, you know, you're, you're always sending yourself signals about what you need. You know, are you thirsty? Do you need some water? Whatever the case is. So it becomes so much easier to listen to that. And I'm yeah. sure in your work, you've probably just seen that, that aspect 
in, in such a big way, not only with yourself, but with your clients. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. It's a really big thing. And I, and, and I think also, you know, my, my experience of expecting to feel fantastic, you know, within a couple of weeks, I, I'm, I'm glad I had that experience now because I can at least share with other people, look, that doesn't happen for most of us. Um, it's, it's quite a slow burn. And, you know, I remember that naturopaths always say, you know, you, you need to allow a month for every month you've had the illness or whatever, don't they? Something like that. And, and, and it's true. It, this does take some time. It takes some time before you you start to feel better, but it's so worth it. It's so worth it. Yeah, really it's is. so good. And if you've managed your thoughts, you know, and done the, done the right thing with just getting your mindset about it, then the yeah. physical part can be, you just can really look at it as a healing process instead of a yeah. deprivation process, which is so cool. Exactly. I mean, I've found that one thing I love is that so many people, when they, you know, once they've ditched the booze, the world opens up to them and they suddenly feel brave enough. I love this thing about being sober makes you brave, you know, um, and, and suddenly it feels possible to, to, you know, do what you've always wanted to do. I mean, I, I, you know, I've always been a mad busy person and, and I've always had a huge amount of energy, but what I've managed to get done since I ditched the booze is unbelievable. It's like, wow, there's more, you know, um, but, but mainly because I feel so much calmer, um, it's, it, it's, it, that side of it is absolutely incredible. Oh, I love yeah. that. So good. So we've, we've kind of talked about it, but just to recap, so, um, TEDx talk, uh, yeah. and podcast. And yeah. So, yeah. Um, and now I have my little thing called the sober club, which is my little kind of community, which is, which is really cool. It's, it's really aimed at people who've kind of ditched the booze and then they really want to do this stuff that I'm talking about, kind of look at the nutrition and the mindset and the what's next. You know, I'm finding that I'm, I'm connecting with a lot of people who are, are now really now starting to think, okay, what's my purpose then? You know, what, you know, now I feel brave enough to, to go start my company or run a charity or change job even, you know, and that's so what's exciting. That? Is that on your, it's the soberclub.com. Okay. Soberclub.com and then imperfectlynatural.com. Yeah. It's all the, it's all the health and wellbeing stuff, but of course they're starting to merge together. You know, that's the amazing thing, isn't it? They, you know, the, the fact that they're starting to merge together. Cause at first, when I first launched my podcast, I thought, well, I'm not, I won't say anything about this on my imperfectlynatural.com site because there might be people who are, you know, really don't like that. And then I thought, no, this is all me. It's all what I do. And it's, and, and I, and I often, and say that it, it that was literally the missing piece of the jigsaw for me and and also with the work that I do around sort of spirituality I'm a Hay House author and I also present on Hay House radio and and that's become so interesting for me because for years I've been writing blog posts and interviewing people and constantly talking about Louise Hay and the concept of loving yourself you know and the importance of of, of self-esteem and self-love but if you'd ever asked me well do you, is, is that true for you it's a bit ridiculous definitely not um so funny when I look back how I'd removed myself from that you know I, I was wow. so clear on it for everyone else but I had no concept that I, that I, you know, there's no way I could love myself. That would, that bit of everything was just, no, that I don't fit that. There's something wrong with me and uh, I can't do that. Um, and now I can, you know, now I can. That's, uh, that was literally the missing piece. That's so beautiful. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. amazing. Really amazing. So let me ask you the last question I always ask every guest, which is really like, if you were going to go back to Janie of young kids and being super busy, um, and you know, and the 3 a.m. wake ups and tell her what life is like on the other side, what would you say? I'd say, you know, um, the emperor isn't actually wearing any clothes. You know, that story of the emperor's new clothes. Um, and, uh, you know, I think of alcohol like that as we see alcohol as so glamorized and so necessary and our reward and our treat, but actually just a few people, you know, called out, you know, the King's not actually wearing any clothes, he's naked. And it's exactly the same, you know, and, and I would have said, actually, do you know what? Alcohol will do nothing for you and it will steal your joy. So yeah, I'd have said that. <laughs> oh, it's so cool. What a cool thing. I love that um, analogy. It's beautiful. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much. It's just been That's great. Such a, it's so such lovely to talk to you. And I'm such a fan of your work and the amazing stuff you've done and all the amazing lives you've changed. It's, um, it's brilliant. When I found your podcast, I get, you know, I'd read, I read, I'd read Claire's book and then, and then I came across your podcast. Wow, this is it. 
awesome. so I was on, you know, literally it really helped me get on the right, the right path. So oh, thank that's you. So wonderful. I am. Um, I I can't help but notice, you know, with with you have such like a colorful and eclectic life of all the things that you've done so far, and I, and I can't help but notice how every single thing that you've done has has really uh, not prepared you necessarily, but but it's influencing in such a positive way what you're doing now, right? Like your ability to present and your. Um, all of the thousands of hours, uh, radio and, mm. and TV and everything. And now here you are like someone who's truly a powerhouse, right. And who has this degree of influence and to be carrying this message. I, I just think it's really awesome. So, mm. just, well, thank you. I really appreciate it. I was really very, no, I, I did go through a phase where I thought maybe I won't, only my close friends will know about this. Maybe I won't ever bring this into my public life as it were. Um, and, and I was very, very nervous when, when I decided to come out, but I just felt I had to. I just felt I had to, really, in case there was one person who felt like me. So, yeah. And I'm sure it's not just one. I'm sure it's many thousands by this point. So it's just the coolest thing. Thank you. So lovely to connect with you. Thank you so much for sharing your platform. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Have a great day. Hi, are you looking to connect with like-minded people? Sometimes maybe you feel like as someone who knows all this information from the snake in mind or the alcohol experiment that you're living in a world of muggles and people just don't speak your language. That is why I created The Exchange. The Exchange is an online community where we meet face-to-face -face, live video calls multiple times a week with people from all over the globe just to connect, to have somewhere you are seen and you're heard and you feel less alone and really that you can give back and get the support you need. So if this sounds great to you, check it out at thisnakedmind.com backslash exchange. And as always, rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast as it truly helps the message reach somebody who might need to hear it today.